Welcome to an introduction to data visualization and analysis. Before we get into the topic at hand, let's remind ourselves where we are in the generalized research cycle. As you'll remember, our broad motivation for research leads us to articulating some overall goal for a particular project. To meet this goal, we need to frame one or more objectives, often in the form of questions. From those questions are derived different tasks, which might also be phrased as questions. Sometimes we can answer the task level question by direct observation, but in other cases where the phenomenon we are interested in can't be directly observed, we need to frame one or more hypotheses, from which we deduce observable predictions that can be tested through observation or experiment. I spoke about this process in the lecture on methods of science and posing research questions. Once you have a clear idea of what exactly needs to be done, it's time to design your study keeping a number of key principles in mind, which I've outlined in the lecture on basics of research design. And the next step is for you to carry out the study you have designed by setting up your experiment or making the observations you need to. This is not a trivial task in itself, but we will skip forward to the point where you have, you have your data, you have digitized it, have checked for errors, and now you need to visualize, analyze, and interpret the information you've collected, such that you can say something about the question you started out with. The basic tools you have available for this are data visualization and data analysis, and I will admit to you that it's not easy to become proficient in these skills. It's easy enough to follow the instructions in a statistics textbook, but unfortunately good analysis and visualization doesn't result from following a fixed recipe. Rather, we have to try and develop an intuition about data and how to treat data in order to extract the information we need. For this, we have to try and get as familiar as possible with numbers and other kinds of data and the ways in which we can work with them. So to start us off on this journey, let's take a look at the different types of data we might deal with during the course of our research. We start with categorical data in which each entity we look at has some state that we can name. So these are sometimes also called nominal data. For example, this bird might be an ashiprinia and the other bird a jungle prinia, and the third one a plain prinia, or this ashiprinia might be male and the other female. Crudely speaking, we can also think of colors as categories like red or blue or yellow. Um, another common category is habitat like grassland versus wetland versus forest and so on. Note that the categorical states are distinct entities with no obvious ranking among them. Unless we measure some other attribute of prinias, we cannot say that ashy is ranked higher than jungle prinia, for example. This now changes with ordinal data. Here the different states can be ranked with respect to each other. Examples include the categories of size like small, medium and large, or categories of age like juvenile, subadult, and adult. And here we can actually order the states by the attribute of interest and can say that adults are older than subadults, which in turn are older than juveniles. This ordering cannot be done for categorical variables. And note that although the different states can be ranked with respect to each other, the interval between ranks need not be uniform and may not be known at all. So although we know that an adult is older than a subadult, there's no information inherent there about how different they are in age, nor whether the difference is the same as the difference between a subadult and juvenile or not. Sometimes people denote ordinal data in numeric form, for example, labeling juveniles one, subadults two, and adults three, for example, but you should be very careful to remember that these data are nevertheless not numeric and do not possess all the properties of numbers that we usually take for granted. A particular kind of ordinal data is the kind of dichotomous data shown in the last two examples. Although dead can arguably, arguably be ranked as less living than alive, in, in practice these kinds of data are usually treated as categorical rather than ordinal. This brings us to numeric data and in particular interval data, which can not only be ranked from low to high, but also have uniform differences or intervals. Take temperature in degrees Celsius, for example. We know not only that 40 degrees is hotter than 30 degrees Celsius, uh, 
but also that the difference between 30 and 40 degrees is the same as that between 30 and 20 degrees. Further, we can also say that the difference between 40 and 30 degrees is twice as much as the difference between 30 and 25 degrees. So the intervals are uniform such that differences are meaningful and the differences themselves can be compared with each other in various ways. But if you think about it, although you can say that 20 degrees is 10 degrees hotter than 10 degrees, you can't say that 20 degrees is twice as hot as 10 degrees. Similarly, you can't say that 30 degrees is 1.5 times as hot as 20 degrees. In other words, taking the ratio of two numbers on an interval scale does not make sense. Why is that? It's because interval scale numbers have no true zero. Zero degrees Celsius is just an arbitrary convention, the freezing point of water. If we used a different convention, like assigning zero as the freezing point of alcohol, which is at minus 114 degrees Celsius, then what we now call 20 degrees would actually be 134 degrees, and 10 degrees would be 124 degrees. The difference between them remains the same, but the ratio completely changes. Similarly, if we used Fahrenheit as our arbitrary convention instead, again there is no true zero. We could measure temperature in Kelvin if we wanted a true zero, but as commonly measured, temperature is on the interval scale with no true zero and therefore ratios of temperatures are not meaningful. Now measures that are associated with a true zero are called ratio scale data because ratios of such numbers make sense in addition to the intervals being uniform and there being an order among them. Examples include length, area, weight, counts and so on. All of these have true zeros and saying that the height of this tree is 1.3 times the height of another or that I've counted twice as many birds in the park compared with at the lake, all of this makes sense. So these are the most common types of data that we would usually handle, but a quick word about a couple of other data types. Circular data are similar to interval data in that there is no true zero. Examples of circular data are angle, direction, time of day and time of year. In all cases, the so-called starting or zero point is arbitrary. At the top of the paper for direction, at midnight for time of day, uh, near midwinter for time of year. Another key point to remember is that in circular data, the numbers wrap around. This means that the difference in angle or direction between 350 degrees and 10 degrees is not 340 degrees, rather it's only 20 degrees. So beware of mechanically performing the usual operations on circular data and treating them as though they are arranged on the standard linear number line. Now in many situations we may be dealing with only a restricted part of the circle. For example, the slope of a mountain side might vary only between 0 and 90 degrees, usually more like 0 and 40 degrees. And within this range we might decide to treat the data as if it were on a linear scale. But if you are dealing with data that go all around the circular scale, then it's best to look up a special branch of analysis called circular statistics. And there are of course other kinds of data as well. For example, location data are increasingly common in our, in our studies, where spatial coordinates like latitude and longitude are key attributes. Uh, and if spatial analysis is of a particular interest to you, then there's a distinct topic of spatial statistics that you should learn about. In molecular ecology, the raw data might come in DNA sequences or allele frequencies and so on. Again, there are specialized ways of dealing with these. But for the rest of this video, we will talk, uh, we will focus on the most common data types in our field. We'll talk a bit about uh, categorical data, but really the emphasis will be on numerical data. Spe uh, specifically ratio type data for which there is a true zero. But before that, let's recapitulate what the most common data related tasks are that we would encounter in our research. Sometimes our task is to measure a single thing in a single place, for example, the number of bird species in a grassland. More often, it's a comparison that's of interest. Here we're comparing the number of species in burnt and unburnt grassland to see which category of grassland has more species and by how many. Note there may be more than two categories to compare. 
but we will restrict ourselves to the simple case of two categories. Another common task is to look for associations or correlations between two measures, leaving aside the question of whether there is a causal relationship between the two. Regardless of the specific task, we need to be very clear on what we are trying to do in a broad sense. In almost all situations, we want to understand some larger population through our sample. If you recall, the population is the larger frame to which we want to be able to generalize. Since we typically can't measure the entire population, we take a sample from the population and we try to design our sampling strategy such that the sample is representative of the population. The word population is used in a statistical sense here. It may refer to an actual population like the population of Great Indian Bustards in Rajasthan or it may refer to a metaphorical population such as the population of all possible one hectare plots in Desert National Park. The whole point of our study design, data collection and analysis is to be able to draw conclusions about the population as a whole from the restricted sample that we are actually able to measure. Now, some jargon is needed here. That aspect of the population which we are trying to measure is called the parameter. And what we actually measure through our sample is called the estimate. So, for example, if we wanted to understand the population density of bustards, we do so by estimating the sample mean density and, of course, hoping that it is not too far from the true population mean density. Notice that I use the word population in two senses here, first to refer to the numbers of bustards and second to refer to the larger set that we want to generalize to. I've done this deliberately not with the intention of confusing you but rather to illustrate that different areas of science use the same word to mean different things and we should guard against the resultant confusion. Here one use of the word population is from the discipline of demographic analysis and the other use is from the discipline of statistics. Similar examples of multiple meanings for the same word include uh, the word error and the word hypothesis. Both will be described a little bit later. Another thing that's useful to know is a bit about conventions of statistical notation. One convention is that population parameters are usually written in Greek letters. For example, the population mean is often written as mu. While, on the other hand, samples are denoted in Latin letters. For example, what you measure is usually written as X and the convention for the sample mean uh, is to be written in that same letter with a horizontal bar on top, in this case X bar. And another convention is to denote specific samples with numbered subscripts. If I measure the trains of 10 peacocks, then I could call those 10 measurements x sub 1, x, x sub 2, and so on until x sub 10. And the general notation would be x sub i. So for example, the formula for the sample mean would look like this. The sum of all x sub i's divided by the sample size n. Another technical word is the term variable, which refers to the aspect being measured. Here, PFAL train length. In the notation above, we denote the variable by x according to convention, but we could just as well denote it by y or z or anything else we wanted. Okay, so with all this in mind, let's start discussing our first possible task, which is to measure a single quantity. So a common task is estimating a single specific quantity of interest, whether that's the sex ratio of Great Indian Bustards in Desert National Park or the density of peafowl in a forest, or, or the average mass of house crows in a city, or the average time spent by uh, magpie robins in singing during the breeding season, and so on. Remember that through our sample, we are estimating what the true quantity might be for the population as a whole that we want to generalize to. So let's say we've carefully designed our study as described in the earlier video in this course, and now we have the raw data with us. For a categorical variable such as sex, the raw data might be a series of labels in which each sampled individual is represented by the label male or the label female. 
For a numeric variable such as body mass, we uh, would have a series of numbers, each representing a single individual. Note that although in these cases each data point represents an individual, it could also represent a nest or a transect or a window or observation time and so on. In other words, the raw data depicts some property of the sampling unit, whatever that sampling unit might be. Now we usually can't make much sense out of a series of labels or numbers and so the raw data needs to be summarized in some way. For categorical data, the obvious way to summarize is to count up the number of individuals in each category. Here there are eight females uh, and six males. I'm using here an example with only two categories for simplicity, but of course there could be multiple categories. Like if you had 51 ashy prinias, 15 jungle prinias, 25 plain prinias, and 11 grey-breasted prinias. So these two summaries are examples of what's called a frequency table. If the raw data are numeric, the usual next step is to summarize them also in a frequency table. If the numbers can take only integer values over a small range, like the number of eggs laid by a female, then we can just count up how many females laid a certain number of eggs from one egg to five eggs here. So there are two columns uh, in the summary, the number of eggs and the corresponding number of data points, in this case females, and this is also known as the frequency of data points, hence the term frequency table. If the range of integer values is large, or if the numbers are not integers, but rather decimals, then we create bins of values and count up how many data points fall into each bin, just as before. What information can we extract from these uh, frequency tables and how do those related how, do, how are those related to the population parameter that we are trying to estimate for categorical data we often want to estimate the proportion of the population that falls in one category or another and this can easily be calculated from the frequency table remember that this is only the sample proportion and we hope but we don't know for sure that it's somewhere near the population proportion we can visualize the data using a bar graph either side by side or stacked on top of each other Notice though that the visual comparison between the two numbers is easier when the bars are side by side. When there are only two levels, here male and female, this visualization doesn't really match, uh, add much insight. We can e easily just look at the frequency table and understand it. But when there are multiple levels, the visualizations can be easier to understand than the frequency tables themselves. Here again, the bars can be arranged side by side or they can be stacked. Uh, the purpose of the visualization is to be able to easily see which categories are more or less frequent and to look at their relative magnitudes. When doing so, it's useful to order them in a sensible way. If there's no natural way to order them, you could just arrange them in decreasing frequency for a quick comparison. So this kind of bar graph provides for a very quick and easy comparison uh, in the frequencies uh, of different categories. Now you'll often have seen pie charts used to visualize uh, frequency data of this nature, but I strongly recommend against doing so for any serious purpose. And that's because in bar charts, the frequencies are represented by the length or height of the bar, and the human eye is very good at estimating relative length. But in pie charts, the frequencies are re represented by the area of the slice of the pie, and the human eye is actually very poor at comparing relative area. So do think very carefully before using pie charts in any formal visualization of your data. Now let's look at what visualizations we can use for numeric data. We can create a dot chart when the data take on integer values. The X axis here shows the values and the Y axis has one dot for each data point that has that value. We can easily see the minimum and maximum, which here are uh, one and five. And we can also see that a clutch size of three is the most common. Now for numeric data that have decimals, let's look at the frequency table. The frequency table also tells us something about the range of the data, the max and min, and the most frequent bins. But as soon as the table has more than a handful of bins, all this is more easily visible by converting the frequency table into a graph. Bar charts of numeric frequency tables are often called frequency distributions or histograms. 
And from this histogram, you can see that the lowest value is somewhere near 13 grams and the highest value is somewhere near 24 grams. We also see that the most common values are roughly at the midpoint of the lowest and highest values, somewhere near 18 grams. Now, this is not necessarily true, of course. The most common values could easily be away from the midpoint, as we will see shortly. So two immediate impressions we get from a histogram are what, are the, what the typical values are and what the span of the data is. The first is referred to in statistics as the central tendency and the second is the variation. Let's talk about the central tendency some more. Very often what we are trying to estimate about a population from our sample is the population's central tendency. The best known such measure is the mean or average. This is a very familiar measure to us all, perhaps so familiar that we don't usually think about it very much. So, but what exactly is the mean? Mathematically, of course, it's the sum of all observations on numbers divided by the sample size. Conceptually, it is the center of gravity of a histogram. If the histogram were like a seesaw, then the center of gravity would be that point which perfectly balances the two arms. Mathematically, if you were to take the distance of each point from the mean and take an average, the sum of all the negative values would exactly equal the sum of the positive values. And so the average deviation from the mean is zero. The implication of this is that the addition of just a few extreme numbers in the data set can affect the mean considerably. Let's look at this data set of the mass of 40 individuals. You can see that the distribution is perfectly symmetrical and it has a mean of 20 grams. If we add just three individuals who are unusually heavy, then the mean increases by quite a bit, changing our estimate of the typical mass of the species. Now, the mean is not the only way of measuring central tendency. There's the mode, the bin or value with the highest frequency. In this example, the bin with the highest frequency remains unchanged with the addition of three unusual individuals. It is still 19.5 to 20.5 grams, so the mode is unchanged. But we'll spend a little more time on the median, which is that number that divides the data set into two equal halves with 50% of the values lying below the median and 50% above. Here's an example, a series of numbers denoting clutch size, that is the number of eggs a female has laid in a nest. Now, we, this is the raw data, but we arrange the data now in ascending order. And since we have a total sample size of 31, which is an odd number, the median is the value in the 16th position so that there are 15 data points lower than the median and the same number of data points larger than the median. If the total sample size was an even number, say 30, then the simplest way to compute the median would be uh, as the midpoint of the 15th and 16th number. Now, this is a relatively symmetrical distribution. So the median, which is three, and the mean, which is 3.4, are pretty close to each other. But unlike the mean, the median is not all that sensitive to the presence of small numbers of extreme data. Suppose there were three individuals with an unusually large clutch size, say 10, 10 and 11. We don't know whether those are true clutches, that is laid by a single female, or whether eggs uh, might have been added through intraspecific brood parasitism, where another female of the same species lays her egg in the nest. Nevertheless, we have these extra data, these extreme values, and the mean then jumps to four eggs, but the median stays exactly where it was at three eggs, just as before. This property of the median, that it is relatively unmoved by unusual or extreme data, is called robustness. And we say that the median is a more robust measure of central tendency than the mean. Now, despite this, the vast majority of studies in ornithology and ecology use the mean and we will largely follow that for the reminder, remainder of this video. But I would urge you to uh, carefully consider using the median and not just default to using the mean just because that's what others have done. Apart from central tendency, the other key thing that we want to understand about a single quantity is its variation, both because it's interesting in its own right and also for what it implies about other aspects of data analysis and interpretation.
The simplest and most crude measure of variation is the range, that is the difference between the smallest and largest values in the data, the minimum and maximum. But the range is unsatisfactory for two reasons. First, it is not a robust measure, and so a single value can change it considerably. For example, taking our set from, data set from earlier, the range of these 31 clutch sizes is 1 to 6. But add just those three extra data points, and the range is now 1 to 11. So the range is clearly not robust in the sense that we have used earlier. Another uh, second issue is that most data distributions are clustered around the central tendency and the range doesn't tell us where the majority of data lie, which would be something very interesting for us. Let's see if we can learn from the use of the median that we discussed earlier. As you know, the median is the value which divides the data set into two equal halves with half of the data points lying below the median and half falling above. We can do something similar using a different criterion. For example, we can define a point that separates the lower 25% of the data from the upper 75%. Let's call this point a quartile because one quarter of the data lies below. Its mirror point is that which separates the lower 75% of the data from the upper 25%. Now we take these two quartiles in the median and put them on the sorted data or the frequency distribution of the data and then we have divided, divided the entire data set into four equal parts. One quarter of the data lies below the first quartile, another quarter lies between the first quartile and the median which we can call the second quartile, yet another quarter lies between the median and the third quartile and the final quarter is above the third quartile. So now we could use the range between the first and the third quartiles as our measure of variation. It tells us the limits within half of the data lie. But of course we don't have to restrict ourselves in this way. We can define any other limits. We could just as well divide the data into say 100 equal parts. Then 1% of the data would lie below the first of the corresponding dividing points. Another 1% would lie between the first and second dividing points and so on. These dividing points are called percentiles since they cut up the data into 100 equal parts. Percentiles are easy to interpret. The 10th percentile is the dividing point between the lowest 10% of values and the upper 90% of values. The 25th percentile is the first quartile, the 50th percentile is the median, and the 75th percentile is the third quartile. You're familiar with this idea from exam scores. If a thousand students write an exam and your rank in the exam is 10, then you scored in the 99th percentile. Only 1% of students scored higher than you. Further, when these points are represented on a scale of 0 to 1 rather than 0 to 100, they are referred to as quantiles, making the median the 0.5 quantile uh, the first quartile is the 0.25 quantile, and so on. So armed with this understanding of quantiles, you will now see that we can choose to represent the variation in our population in any number of ways. For example, here's a distribution of 1000 uh, body masses. We might want to know the points between which 90% of the values lie. In other words, which is the 0 0.05 quantile, and the 0.95 quantile. And so we see that 90% of the body masses lie between 15.1 uh, and 24.7 grams. Or let's say we want the points between which the central 95% of the values lie. That is the 0 0.025 and the 0.975 quantiles. Here we see that 95% of the body masses lie between 14.4 and 25.4 grams. If you're not familiar with quantiles from before, all this may be a bit confusing, but I'm spending considerable time on them because you will come across them often in your readings and they're fundamental to a further understanding of data and its properties. So please uh, do watch this section multiple times until it makes sense to you. And also play around with numbers on a piece of paper or in a spreadsheet program, sorting them and counting up uh, places until you feel you've gained an intuitive understanding of quantiles. Okay, so much for quantile-based measures of variation for now. Uh, let's talk about another measure, which many of you will be 
familiar with. Let's say we wanted to construct a measure of variation as something that tells us how far the average data point is from the mean. Taking this literally, we can calculate how far each data point is from the mean and then take an average. Unfortunately, as discussed earlier, one of the properties of the mean is that the sum of all deviations from it is zero, with the positive deviations exactly equal to the negative deviations. So this doesn't work. Now we could potentially get rid of the negative sign by taking the absolute deviation, but instead we'll use another method of removing the negative sign, which is by squaring. We square each deviation and add all the squared deviations up and take the mean. Now one further complication, when taking the mean we divide the sum of squared deviations not by the sample size, that is how many numbers we have, but rather by what's called the degrees of freedom. So let's make a quick detour to understand what degrees of freedom means.